We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. Mother Teresa could not beat these charges. And now, if you don't mind, I'm going to go into the icebox and sit for a long time. Thank you very much. Guilty on all counts. Welcome to Trump Trials Sidebar, a podcast from The Washington Post, a case that was once called the runt of the litter compared to other cases against Donald Trump. But it's the case that found its way to trial, to a jury and on Thursday to conviction. Twelve New Yorkers, seven men and five women found Donald Trump guilty of 34 counts of falsifying business records. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm joined by James Homan here in the newsroom. Also, Dan Baltz, our Washington Post chief correspondent. And in lower Manhattan, Rhonda Colvin. She's outside the courthouse. Uh, the drama's moved away from the courthouse, but Rhonda's uh, sticking there to tell us all about what it was like today. On this episode, we'll dive into just what that moment was like, the reactions, and then the potential consequences that Donald Trump could face. We'll also talk about what happens next in the political realm. First, let's start with this headline. A former U.S. president has been convicted of a felony. Dan, did you ever think you'd see that headline? Uh, well, no, but... Certainly, when Donald Trump was indicted in four different jurisdictions uh, in a variety of cases, that possibility became real. Uh, and, and today, it became historically real. So um, by the end of this trial, I think everybody had to assume that it was quite possible that he would become a convicted felon once the jury returned its verdict. But um, in our lifetimes of covering politics and covering presidents, uh, Post Richard Nixon, it seemed inconceivable. What does it mean, Dan, for him to be a convicted felon? Well, you know, it's a really, it's a, I think it's a complicated question in some ways, but very simple in other ways. Um, he, he, he joins a list of nobody else in the history of the American presidency. Um, of all of the presidents that we have had, good, bad, and in between, he is the only one who will go down in history until something else unusual might happen as having been convicted uh, in a court of law by a jury of his peers. Uh, and I, I don't think you can understate the historical significance of that, what it does and what it means for his legacy, no matter what happens in November, whether he's elected or not. Um, he is unique in the annals of the American presidency. I mean, he was already unique in having having been in, uh, uh, impeached on two different occasions. He was acquitted in those cases uh, by a jury of political uh, political jurors. Um, but in this case, this was totally different. Um, and I think that's what makes this day, this moment, uh, so compelling uh, as we think about the history of the Trump presidency. We're taping this episode of Sidebar on Thursday night. It's about three hours after the jury delivered the verdicts. Rhonda, take us back to that moment and what it was like. Well, it was really a moment that in my reporter's notebook, I'll probably always remember because we were expecting the judge to go ahead and call it a day. Uh, that's what we were preparing for. He was going to bring jurors back in uh, and tell them that they could pick back up. Uh, later on, but uh, things turned very quickly. In fact, we had started to pack up, uh, but you felt a change in the energy on the street. We're right across from uh, the courthouse complex where uh, this historic moment took place. And you felt that sort of energy shift on the street. Uh, we're, we're with other media, so everyone started uh, to get in line, ready to report, ready to hear what uh, these uh, 12 jury members had to say about the former president. Uh, at the moment when uh, people on the street learned that uh, he was found guilty uh, on all 34 counts, I did hear cheers from an area where the NYPD has further back behind me, uh, where they have people who are protesting, demonstrating, or, or what have you. You could hear cheers from people. Uh, and we've also been standing here since the news has been delivered. It's been a few hours now. But uh, just a few moments ago, we heard uh, who I think was a New Yorker, two young men on bikes who were passing by and they were asked 
asking reporters what just happened. And one reporter said, well, Trump was found guilty. And one of the, uh, the bikers said, on all counts? And you can see him take it all in. So it was someone who may not have been following this court case point by point, but the news struck him uh, enough where he said, wow, this, this is certainly an important day for the United States. And then he biked away. So, you know, people are still catching up to the news, but, you know, everyone who has heard it, whether they uh, are supportive of the uh, conviction or not, it is carrying some weight. People, it's sinking in that this was such a historic moment today. Hmm. Uh, James, I want to talk to you a little bit more about just what these charges meant and how they came out the way they did. But there are a lot of questions on people's minds right now about Trump's future. So let's dive into some of those right away. Can Trump be president of the United States? Yes, absolutely. The as Constitution, a convicted felon. as a convicted felon, the Constitution doesn't say anything about uh, convicts serving in the presidency. Can he vote in the 2024 election? Can he vote for himself? <laughs> That's a trickier question. Most likely, yes. Trump likely will be able to cast a ballot. He now, even though he's just been convicted in New York as a Florida resident, uh, not really a swing state anymore. Uh, Trump heavily favored to carry it. So Florida law is interesting because it says that those convicted of crimes in other states can't vote if they're barred from voting in the state where they committed their offense. So in a lot of states, Trump wouldn't be able to vote if he had been convicted there. But New York law bans felons from voting while incarcerated, but not when they're on probation or parole. And Trump's going to remain out uh, while he awaits appeal. Uh, the Alvin Bragg didn't answer when reporters were yelling at him after his press conference if he would uh, basically uh, try to get Trump in jail right away or make him serve a sentence, which is likely not to be jail after a, there is a sentencing date sent set rather July 11th. But but those can always fall July 11th, right before the Republican National Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, the point is that Trump is because he's free awaiting appeal. He is unlikely to be behind bars or incarcerated in the fall. And so he will be able to vote for himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, you know, Devlin Barrett, our colleague who is the co-author of the newsletter, The Trump Trials, he's been our guest here on the podcast a lot. He had this bit of wisdom. He said, when the jury comes back with a verdict, people say, oh, yep, yep, yep. I, I could see that happening. That makes sense. <laughs> right. When you try to read the tea leaves in advance, you really don't know how the jury is going to go. But then when you look at it with hindsight, things fall into place. Um does this fall into place for you? With hindsight, does what the jury decided based on what they heard make sense? Uh, yes, it was a complicated case. And we, we know that it, that it took the prosecutors hours uh, to do their summation this week um, because they were walking through so much evidence that they had presented. Um, but the weight of the evidence um, was such that uh, no matter the weakness of Michael Cohen as a as a witness, uh, you know somebody who's been convicted for lying and who stole money from the Trump organization. Despite all of that, uh, things fit together. That this puzzle that the that the prosecutors were trying to uh, show the 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 jury uh, ultimately fit together for the jurors. And it was interesting that they did come to a decision fairly quickly. I think that. Uh, I, I suspect that the Trump team was um, was feeling reasonably good by four o'clock today with the idea that this jury was still not able to make a decision. Um, and so when the when the jurors announced to the the judge that they were they had a verdict and they were ready to go, you can you can you can sense that everything kind of changed in the way that the Trump team obviously was looking at this because a verdict that quickly. Uh, meant that at least on most of the counts, he was going to be found guilty. And as it turned out, it was it was unanimous, all 34 counts. Um, but it was it was a it was a strong case that they presented. And the defense did what it could to try to muddy it up. Uh, but in the end, much of this had to do with the documents um, and not as much necessarily with Michael Cohen. And so uh, I, I think all of that fit together so that when they came back this quickly, uh, when I heard that they had a verdict, my 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 gut said to me, uh, "This is going to be a guilty verdict, whether it's on all 34 counts uh, or a majority of them." 
I don't want to downplay how significant this moment is, Dan, for the justice system, uh, for how the law and the courts work. But does this matter politically? Well, Rhonda, you know, I mean, uh, let me, that's the, that's the million dollar question. Um, you know, we can look at polling that has been done before this verdict came down that indicated that some people might change their mind. Uh, but I also have to, you know, point to the fact that um, this, this election, this contest between President Biden and former President Trump uh, has been static for you know, the better part of a year, if not more than that. Nothing seems to move the needle in one direction or another in any significant way. Uh, we will all be watching very closely the, the initial polls that are taken over the next you know, 10 days or two weeks. Um, but I'm not even sure that those are going to be indicative of what the real impact of this is. It will sink in on people. I suspect it will have some impact on some voters, but we don't know um, in the end whether this is really going to change anything. I mean, this is this is still a verdict. Uh, ultimately, Trump's, you know, Trump's future is going to be decided by a verdict of the American people, not 12 jurors in, in a Manhattan courtroom. Dan, your reporting does two of my favorite things. You talk to real people and you, you go out and you talk to people and you don't just like hypothesize, you do the reporting. But you also are able to give this sweeping perspective because you've covered politics uh, for a lot of time and you have a lot of sources who've been in that world uh, for a long time, too. Do you think this might be a before and after moment? Um, so many Trump supporters are accusing, you know, this lawfare, like the warfare of the justice system. Trump is uh, you know, repeating all these lies about the prosecutors and the people involved in this. Do you see this as a potential before and after moment for how law and politics collide? I'm a little reluctant to go that far. I mean, I think that we have seen uh, over the, the history of Trump as a political candidate, as a candidate for president and as president, um, um, get to moments where it looked like something dramatic was going to happen to his standing with the American people. Uh, and, and rarely has that happened. And so I, I'm, I'm tentative about answering that question in any definitive way. Uh, you know, in you know, in the great sweep of history, perhaps it should. Uh, you know, the, a former president convicted of a crime, uh, thirty-four counts, thirty-four felony counts. Um, you would think that that would have some impact on on people, uh, and yet we know that there people bring so much else to the consideration of the election and who they want as president, including what they think of President Biden and his performance. Um, that we're just going to have to wait. I mean, uh, we have months to go. We have a debate that's coming up. We have a Supreme Court decision that's coming up in June. We have the conventions. We'll have another debate. Um, we're we're going to have to watch and wait. Um, and as you say, we're going to have to listen to listen to people, uh, both in the polling and, and directly as we talk to them around the country, and particularly uh, the, those handful of people in the battleground states who really have this election in their hands. Dan Baltz, Chief Correspondent for The Washington Post. Thanks so much, Dan. Everybody else, stay with us. Uh, you're listening and watching The Trump Trials Sidebar. This is The Trump Trials Sidebar from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm with James Homan, Rhonda Colvin, and now Robin Gavon. Welcome, Robin. Um, I want to pick up James with you on something that Dan Baltz was just talking to us about. Could this be a before and after moment? And I don't just mean for Trump's politics. Right. Doesn't seem like it will be that definitive, frankly. But could it be for how battles are waged in courtrooms or through law? Because Trump's trying to claim this was a weaponized situation. I do think we're going to see this as a potentially hinge point in modern political history because Republicans are taking away from this that this was somehow illegitimate. Uh, I don't think it was illegitimate, uh, but they believe this was the justice system weaponized against someone for political reasons. One of the questions Alvin Bragg didn't respond to that a reporter was yelling at him at the end of his press conference was, are you worried about retribution if Trump becomes president? Trump, after all, has been out there saying, I am your retribution. I am your revenge. And it, it, there's a lot of checks and balances in our system. And Trump availed himself of, of all of them in this process. Uh, but I, I do think that we will see 
partisan prosecutions in the future because this has created this sense that these things often lead to kind of tit for tat. It's easy to imagine some Texas prosecutor uh, trying to charge Joe Biden with something uh, next year if he loses. And uh, he will have legal recourses. He'll be able to appeal. He hasn't committed any crime that we know about. Uh, it, but I, I do think that this is a, I mean, this is a sad day for American, the American system. I mean, it's accountability. Uh, the rule of law worked. Uh, the jury made the decision after a day and a half of deliberation. But it is a, a somber moment. Uh, even if you really dislike Donald Trump, it's a somber moment for the country. Um, Rhonda, let's go to you in New York. I know the sun is setting. It's after eight o'clock uh, Thursday evening now. Does it matter or make a difference that Trump was convicted on all 34 charges? It was a clean sweep. Yeah, I think it does. And probably politically, it makes the biggest difference. If you think about it, if there had been uh, an acquittal or if there had been a mixed bag of verdicts, uh, you know, counts one through 10 were not guilty, but 11 through 15 were, you could see where the former president might be able to use that to a political advantage in his messaging saying uh, that the jury, you know, did acquit him on some things. You know, he would have been able to challenge that type of uh, verdict if it was a mixed bag. But given that it was unanimous, that, that that's a pretty big deal. Um, we'll see in the, the next few days, the next few weeks, probably up until the election, uh, how he messages around that. But I think we got a little bit of a taste uh, right after when he spoke to cameras uh, and said that this was a, a rigged system. That's something we have heard from him uh, pretty much every day of this uh, experience where he's come talk to the cameras in the courthouse and uh, had almost, you know, sort of these uh, impromptu press briefings uh, talking about this case, talking about the judge. Uh, I think what's also important, too, in the fact that it's unanimous is, and what I'll be listening out for, is uh, other Republicans. You know, of course, I'm a, a Capitol Hill reporter, uh, and I'm wondering what you know, some senators are going to say about this. I was just actually reading uh, Senator Tim Scott's uh, statement. He put out a video actually uh, a few moments ago, and I was looking through it, and he directly attacks uh, D.A. Bragg, saying, D.A. Bragg, hear me clearly. You cannot silence the American people. So the fact that this is unanimous is also going to change the messaging uh, for Republicans overall who do support uh, the former president. So there's no mixed bag to talk about. It was all you know, 34 counts. So they're going to have to message on that. Mm. You know, Rhonda, you brought up how Trump reacted. So I want to play a little bit of the tape of Donald Trump in the hall. And it's this classic shot we've seen a lot of now. Trump would walk in, talk to the cameras, really yell at the cameras because it's not like he was miked properly. So he's sort of shouting to the reporters and the cameras in the hall. After he was found guilty this afternoon, he walked out, did his shouting to the cameras and then left, got in the motorcade and went to Trump Tower Let's listen to a little bit of what Trump had to say. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. We were at 5% or 6% in this district, in this area. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. But the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people, and they know what happened here, and everybody knows what happened here. You have a Soros-backed DA, and the whole thing, we didn't do a thing wrong. I'm a very innocent man, and it's okay. I'm fighting for our country. I'm fighting for our Constitution. All right, we're going to go to Robin in a minute, but first, a quick fact check on aisle five, James Bowman, <laughs> because we really do a, have a lot to of fact that wasn't check true. What, what Donald Trump said. Yeah, this isn't George Soros pulling the strings. Uh, Alvin Bragg is an elected prosecutor. Manhattan is a very Democratic area. Uh, but he couldn't get a venue change he, because it's a it's, it's a, a Manhattan case. crime yeah. he committed, uh, and he uh, uh, the jury found him guilty. Okay. He had uh, he had the chance to testify. He chose not to. They didn't hold that against him. And the judge had many measured decisions where he heard both sides. Sometimes. He did decide for mm -hmm. Trump's team. Trump could have testified had he wanted to. He wasn't gagged in court in right. the way that he's sort of claiming. Exactly. So important to keep those all in mind. Robin, I want to go to you, though, for what is your reaction? So Robin is our senior critic at large here at The Washington Post. When you hear Donald Trump in this moment where he is now a felon, 
What goes through your mind? Well, you know, I, I agree. I think it's a very sobering moment. And, you know, I don't know what it means for sort of the future political landscape of the country. But, you know, I'm also an optimist. And so, you know, I couldn't help but think about the jury. And, you know, we don't know much about them at all other than um, sort of the gender split. And, you know, but I do know that, you know, I still live in New York. I have been called for jury duty. I know what the jury pool is like, and it is a vast array of humanity. And I think at a time when we cannot, as a country, agree on whether or not the sky is blue, the fact that these 12 ordinary citizens gathered in a room and came to a consensus is really quite a miraculous thing. And I and I think that in some ways that is a little bit of a, not necessarily an antidote, but a little bit of a bomb in this moment that yes, democracy, you know, the judicial system, so to speak, worked, but really that it showed, I think, just sort of the power and the courage of ordinary citizens to just sort of do their job. There also isn't a hierarchy, right? I mean, Rhonda, you know, the the four person was the four person because they happened to be the first juror. Um, can you tell us a little bit, Rhonda, about what the jury was weighing? What do we know they wanted to hear and dig into after they got this case in their hands? They wanted to hear a little bit more. They wanted to go back and hear uh, a little bit of that testimony and the instructions read again. What was on their minds? And, and I'm saying we're reading this from the tea leaves, right? Because we know what they were asking for. Right. Uh, a lot of people were trying to read into the fact that the, the jury asked to hear more uh, clarification and a reread of the uh, jury instructions that the judge had really just read to them, uh, which that, that was a bit of a head scratcher for some people and a, a point that people uh, speculated about, wondering why would they want to hear uh, more about the instructions on the law that these uh, cases were argued around. Uh, they also wanted to hear about the, the Pecker and the Cohen uh, testimonies, uh, specifically about about the meeting that happened in Trump Tower. It seemed as if they wanted to, and, and this was their job, if, if uh, the prosecution had their way, uh, they wanted to look into uh, if Trump was knowledgeable and that this did apply to uh, that election statute that the prosecution wanted to use. It's a New York state law uh, that uh, said that this could be, that tried to apply uh, the hush money scheme to election interference. So it appears that they were trying to sew together all of these threads, tying Cohen, Trump, Pecker into a scheme uh, where these hush money payments were concealed uh, in order to suppress the stories and also to uh, have better odds at the 2016 election. James, the thing they also wanted to seem to get a sense of, they wanted to hear again in the jury instructions was like the bar yeah. of proof. And it's a, there's a funny thing. This is very common. Yeah, when I was on yeah. jury duty, the judge actually said the same thing that Judge Mershon said, which is uh, basically defining an inference to, to infer, because ultimately what the jury had to decide was, even if you think, you know, these did, did Trump knowingly violate the law? Did he knowingly have these business records falsified to commit another crime, which the prosecution said was trying to affect the outcome of the election? Now, the line in the jury instructions that the judge reread said, if you wake up in the morning and you look outside and there are people wearing raincoats and there's water on the ground, you can infer that it rained. Even if you didn't see it rain, you can infer that it was raining. And the jury wanted to hear that again. We don't know. You know, two of the 12 members of the jury were lawyers, lawyers. Uh, it is a weird thing because it the, it literally took 75 minutes for the judge to read the jury instructions and uh, they don't get a copy of them because you're supposed to just like soak it all in. And so they wanted that to happen again. It makes me think that they initially went around the table and someone said, well, how do we really know? What is it? How can we infer that Trump wanted this to happen or knew it was going to happen or that it was likely to happen? And so they had the judge reread that section and clearly it was persuasive. Yeah. And Robin, there's something there about like common sense and understanding how the law intersects with our daily lives. Yeah. I mean, and I think that what what is so striking to me is that this was a case that was that was complicated. And at times it was 
you know, when you, you didn't have the sort of very spectacular testimony from David Pecker and Stormy Daniels that it did get a little bit sort of into the weeds of financial minutia. And, you know, the jury has to deal with that. They have to just sort of absorb it all. And I mean, I think it's extraordinarily difficult to sort of go through all of that and not have a transcript in front of you. Uh, and, And so I think it really speaks just incredibly highly of, of the jury and their capacity and their willingness uh, to do this in a way that seems quite ridiculous and uh, quite conscientious. And so when I hear, you know, sort of all of the the politicians sort of getting their, you know, their, the hairs on the back of their neck up and they start getting their fighting position, it just sort of seems like, you know, they are the ones who are creating so much fury and that if just regular citizens were left to their own devices without all the flame throwing, that we'd be in a much better place. What do you see this case as fundamentally being about, Robin? You know, to some degree, I felt like it was... Um, you know, sort of a test to the degree in which we believed in in ordinary citizens to understand what it means when someone is really trying to pull one over on them. It felt like it was the case, particularly when Stormy Daniels was testifying and people were so, uh, you know, upset about, you know, that her testimony was so provocative. And I thought, well, it's not really that provocative what she's saying. Uh, You know, it's just sort of a reflection of how we are somewhat squeamish about anything that has to do with sex. But what she's actually saying is not all that explicit. And so I thought a lot of it just really had to do with the way that ordinary people seem to be so much more comfortable in dealing with certain topics in recognizing that people can, that people are complicated, that they sometimes lie and they sometimes tell the truth. And just because they do those two things doesn't mean that they are always a liar and that they're a terrible person. It just felt that, you know, ordinary people are incredibly thoughtful. And I found that to be somewhat reassuring in the midst of all the things that were deeply troubling. Mm. One last question for you, Robin. What are you going to be watching from Donald Trump in the days and weeks ahead? Well, I mean, I'm curious in some ways to see just how far he is willing to sort of take his um, trashing of democracy and the Constitution as being sort of his enemies in this regard. And I mean, that really seems to be where he wants to kind of take this fight. It doesn't seem, you know, a lot of it just seems to be um, bluster. But when he starts getting into a conversation about how the Constitution is corrupt, um, I think that's when um, I think that's that's when the ground shifts tremendously. Robin Gavon, senior critic at large, we're going to let you go. Uh, Rhonda James, stick around. This is the Trump Trials sidebar. Let's listen to a little bit of what Alan Bragg had to say, uh, the Manhattan DA who uh, was at the head of this uh, case. Here's what he had to say on Thursday evening. Everyday jurors vowed to make a decision based on the evidence and the law and the evidence and the law alone. Their deliberations led them to a unanimous conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Donald J. Trump, is guilty of 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree to conceal a scheme to corrupt the 2016 election. I did my job. Our job is to follow the facts and the law without fear or favor. uh, And that's exactly what we did here. And 
what I feel is gratitude to work alongside phenomenal public servants who do that each and every day uh, in matters that you all write about uh, and make the press and in lots of matters that you don't. Uh, I did my job, we did our job. Um, many voices out there. Um, the only voice that matters is the voice of the jury and the jury has spoken. DA Alvin Bragg speaking Thursday evening. Uh, Rhonda, what does this conviction mean for his office? Well, and I, I do want to point out there that when we listen to that entire press conference, it seems like he was measured. This wasn't really a victory lap. Uh, that might prove to be important because uh, this is a case, of course, that puts him very much in the spotlight. Of course, he was when the indictment was handed down last year. But even so, uh, even more so right now, as we you know start uh, the what happens after a conviction, the sentencing hearing, all of that, where this case goes from here. Uh, so this, you know, is a part of his uh, professional uh, world, but his, his political world. But, you know, also you have to remember Alvin Bragg was really targeted at the beginning of all of this. Uh, he is the, the first uh, black DA uh, in uh, Manhattan. He uh, did experience there was chatter about race and racially tinged uh, rhetoric that was pointed at him in the beginning of all of this. So this was this was probably not a very easy uh, case to bring up and uh, go to sleep on for him and his family, too. They've also uh, been attacked as well. So we'll see where this goes. We'll see how it affects uh, his job as a DA moving forward. But it is interesting to hear him talk about this case as just business as usual, that they just did their job, even though it dealt with some someone who was uh, formerly uh, the most powerful person in the world and, and could very well be again come November. Rhonda, let's talk about the timing of that sentencing hearing in July. So that sentencing hearing is set for July 11th. Of course, that is just uh, a few weeks after the very first debate between the former president and the current president in Atlanta. And then after that sentencing hearing, you're going to have uh, the Milwaukee uh, Republican National Convention where the former president is likely uh, to get the nomination uh, for his party formally. So you see how this trial, uh, the conviction, the, the sentencing, it's all tangled up in this election. Uh, it's such a remarkable schedule that we will all be covering. James, what sentences are on the table? So the maximum. What can the judge, the, and also yeah. talk to us about who decides, how does the judge right. do this? Right? So the jury decides the, the guilt or innocence. The judge decides the sentence. The judge, so yeah, so I get what's going to happen. Uh, it's not going to be a big public uh, hearing. Uh, Donald Trump's going to go back to the courthouse where he was convicted today. He's going to sit down with essentially like a parole officer, and he's going to be interviewed as any convicted criminal would. And they'll ask him, about his mental health history. They'll ask him if there were any extenuating circumstances that led him to commit these crimes, uh, about any drug use. Uh, it's, it's stuff that would normally be, you know, if you, if you robbed a bodega, they want to know if there were any mitigating factors to consider in sentencing. And then this person will prepare a, a five to six single space page pre-sentencing report. We'll never see it. It's confidential. It's for the judge and the lawyers. And then the judge will read it. Judge Marchand. Judge Marchand. Judge. And he will make a determination. He has a very wide range of uh, potential sentences. Uh, the maximum sentence uh, the kind of this based on the guidelines is one and a third to four years in prison because each of those different 34 counts would be served concurrently. It's not like they stack on top of each other and cascade. It's very unlikely that Judge Mershon would sentence Donald Trump to jail time. And that would be the case even if he wasn't the presumptive Republican nominee. Uh, he's 77 years old. He has no criminal history, no prior convictions. He has just been convicted of a nonviolent crime. And and so he isn't likely to send Trump to Rikers Island jail. He could sentence him to home confinement. Uh, he could say, uh, you have to spend three months or six months uh, and can't leave your home. And that doesn't necessarily have to be Trump Tower. Uh, they could work with Florida authorities. This is pretty routine. Uh, it could be Mar-a-Lago. It could be Bedminster in New Jersey. And uh, and obviously, it's a logistical nightmare with the You're running the for, president. Well, for president. You're running for president. Secret it's, Service, it's, too. It, yeah. But he, he, 
it's very unlikely that Trump spends a day in jail, certainly before the election. There are going to be appeals. They actually have uh, some credible grounds for appeal, the complicated nature of this case, as we've been talking about, to take it from a misdemeanor to a felony, uh, the Stormy Daniels testimony, did she go into too much detail? Was that prejudicial? Uh, there there are a couple things that Trump will fight uh, through the appellate courts that takes a very long time. Harvey Weinstein just a few weeks ago had uh, a conviction tossed out from a few years ago uh, based on essentially a witness testifying about a sexual assault that he wasn't charged for. And this is Stormy Daniels, in this case, testifying about a sexual assault he's not being charged for. There's a reason that she testified. Trump sort of brought it, begged the question by uh, trying to scrutinize her story, which allowed her to go into more detail. They didn't object. But and I want to just pause yeah. you on one thing. So you used the phrase sexual assault for Stormy Daniels. Thank you for, and yeah. It's a sexual encounter. Right. She says they had sex, but you're not wrong right. because she did in her testimony characterize it in a way that sounded uh, non-consensual right. or bordering on non-consensual. Right. And so there's a question of if that could affect the jury and their perception of Trump. But his his lawyers did not object when that was going on. So that so that, that that's this right. area that gets a little gray about just should, how far. Should there, should yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the and absolutely. the judge had said mm -hmm. to the prosecution, "Don't go into too much detail." And then we. But then Trump stepped up in the door. Then Trump stepped so, yeah. up in the door, and Stormy Daniels was eager to share details yeah. because she was defending her integrity and trying to show that her story's mm -hmm. true when Trump's denying it. So yes, Trump. She didn't. Uh, Stormy Daniels doesn't say sexual assault. She says she sort of found herself under him and it felt like it just sort of happened and so but all of that is to say there will be an appeal and and courts are reluctant to strike down the wisdom of these juries uh but alvin bragg didn't answer when someone said will you object if trump asks to be free pending these mm -hmm. appeals which he could drag out for a long time uh the this the the people, the Manhattan DA could say Trump needs to do his time. I suspect they will ask for that. But I, my hunch is that Judge Mershon is going to be reluctant to to make Trump serve his sentence earlier than he would otherwise have to. Rhonda, in the time that we've been talking to you, the sun has officially set in New York. <laughs> uh, and so thank you so much for sticking out this very long day. I want to get any final thoughts from you. Um, if you're listening to us on podcast apps, you can hear the New York City scene behind Rhonda. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that it's now dark. She's like framed in darkness. Final thoughts from you tonight, Rhonda. Just want to let you know, you said long day, but a long week. <laughs> so we've all we've been staked out here for a while. Yes, thank you. Uh, and, and so have other uh, members of the media. Uh, but of course, we keep saying it, but I think we can continue to highlight it, that it's been a historic day. Uh, it's been a day that you probably don't think you would cover as a reporter, uh, but here we are. But, you know, right now, uh, this story may just be beginning. Uh, we, of course, will uh, likely want to seek if any jurors will want to talk about what happened and, and some of the things that we've been talking about on this show. What was their thought process? Uh, we'll also, you know, know more about if and when this affects uh, voters, those voters who uh, might still be undecided, that slim march of voters who may be undecided between the two candidates for president. Uh, and what, you know, what happens after this? I, I really think we are at, even though it's the end of this trial, uh, it may only really be the beginning in a lot of ways. Thanks so much, Rhonda. James, thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. That's all for us today on this episode of the Trump Trials Sidebar on what Rhonda said is an incredibly historic day. Now, this trial may be over, but don't worry, we're not going anywhere. We will be back with you next Thursday. So much yet to cover as we track the fallout of this decision, as we watch what happens in the other cases that Trump faces, and as we watch how the Supreme Court uh, weighs in on this question of immunity that could come in the next couple of weeks. You can watch us on YouTube. It's YouTube dot com slash Washington Post. You can listen to us on your favorite podcast app and definitely subscribe to the Trump Trials newsletter, which our colleagues write and they are just filling up my inbox with all kinds of wisdom and nuggets and answering your questions. So check that out for sure. James, Rhonda, thank you. I'm Libby Casey. We'll see you again soon.